423 Summit Avenue. Here's Tony Weiscroft and Hank Davis. Moshe Fetter knocking on the door at 423 Summit Avenue. Being invited in by someone. Hey. How are you going? Today is March 31st, 1990, and greetings to everyone watching this at Court Flu 7 in New Can you York. wait? Huh? Okay. I'm gonna. I don't like the focusing. Alright, take your time. Take two. Take two. <laughs> okay, go. Today is March 31st, 1990. Greetings to everyone watching this at Court Flu 7 in New York on May 5th. This tape is our special surprise program item because I'm speaking to you from a famous address, 423 Summit Avenue, the home of Harry Warner Jr. We couldn't convince Harry to visit us in New York for the con, so we've come to him to bring him to you on tape, an opportunity for which we're grateful. Before we get started, I'd particularly like to acknowledge the assistance of Linda Bushager, who provided the equipment and accommodations en route, and is sitting behind the camera as I speak, and of Hank Davis and Tony Weisskopf, whose faint claps you may be hearing, who are sharing the driving and best boy chores. Uh, this project couldn't have happened without them. And I guess uh, I'll just go into the questioning here. Uh, Harry, as you know from FAPA, I'm still an inexperienced interviewer. I feel strange to be interviewing a journalistic pro, pro like yourself. And if you sense me going astray or uh, missing something, I hope you'll redirect me. And I've also asked my friendly assistants here to do the same. Right. And this paper is older than this house. I think it's falling apart. Uh, before we can review your career in fandom, I think we'd better establish some context. Uh, for as long as I can remember, you've made a point for reminding us how ancient you are. So, just when exactly were you born and where? Well, it was in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, about 22 miles north of here, on December 19th, 1922. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've had trouble getting both birthday and Christmas presents. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, so it means that you're actually younger than my father, despite, despite all your claims of decrepitude. <laughs> younger than anybody. Uh, <laughs> my father's still in pretty good shape, but you seem to be in fair shape yourself. Um, what are your earliest memories of, uh, uh, of reading experiences in general, and, and when and how did you happen to discover science fiction? Uh, my father got a couple of Jewel Byrne novels from the library for me to read. I read a little science fiction in the Howell and Julius Big Little books, which were popular a long, long time ago. But um, I didn't discover the Persians until 1933. Uh -huh. I bought my first Amazings and Wonders in that year. Hmm, okay. Uh, I guess there wouldn't have been too many other sources for for books back then, most of the science fiction was in the... No, in the Hagerstown Public Library, children were not permitted in the adult area. Uh -huh. So I couldn't get science mm -hmm. fiction from the library until I was much older. Right. Okay. And there weren't any paperbacks, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, were there any other science fiction readers uh, in your age group? Are any local friends reading this stuff? No, I knew only one other person in Hagerstown who read science fiction and... Um, he never seemed to want to talk about it very much. Yeah, so. Contrary to the usual uh, pattern. Yeah, I've lost track of it completely. Huh. I wonder whatever happened to him. Well, uh, when, did you, when and how did you first discover the existence of fandom? Uh, that came about because I wrote a letter to Brass Tax <laughs> in 1936. The first letter. It got published, <laughs> and in the letter I asked for correspondence. Yes. Okay, so you were 14 years old? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. okay. So you included your address? Beg pardon? You included your address? Yeah. And I got about a dozen letters as a result of that request for correspondence. And I began to correspond regularly with about half a dozen of them. I also received several fanzines as a result of that letter. And That's a good letter. I couldn't make head or tail out of the fanzines. And I just <laughs> simply ignored them. Uh -huh. 
Did he say which issue of, of uh, Stanley it was? I, would, uh, I don't remember the exact, I think it was August, September, something like that. And the year? We had to look that letter up. 36. 36. I think I have all the 36. I can check it when I'm back in Lexington. Uh, okay. Uh, now, were you already at this address at that point? No, I was at um, Brian Place on Brian Place okay. at the time. Okay. Now, when did your family move from Pennsylvania to Maryland? Well, actually, they were living in Maryland at the time of my birth. It just happened to die made an unexpected arrival on the scene while my mother was visiting friends in Chambersburg. Oh, okay. So, so but so essentially you've lived here your whole life? And this, this virtually, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, actually, before I forget, I mean to ask you about that. What's the right pronunciation? Is it Hagerstown or Hagerstown? Hagerstown. Hagerstown, okay. The founder really spelled his name H-E-G-E-R uh -huh. and pronounced it Hager. He was a German. German. Right. But it was anglicized into H-A-G-E-R when it was published in English language newspapers and so people started to call it Hagerstown. Mm, mm. This is just like with my last name actually, which is really should be pronounced Fader in German. My father says it that way in fact. Okay, so you had these correspondence from uh, your appearance in Brass Tax and you had some fanzines that you received, which were the first models you had for yeah, the concept of a fanzine. But I wasn't interested in fanzines at that time. Two years later, one of my correspondents got interested in fanzines, and he um, managed to persuade me to take an interest in That was James Avery. James Avery, yeah. Right. He's up in Maine. He was up in Maine. Later, he became a journalist in Virginia. As far as I know, he's still down there in the Newport News oh, area. Oh, really? Does, does, do you know if he retains an interest in science fiction? No, I don't think he has any interest. I continued to be in touch with him sporadically until about ten years ago. And I've lost touch with well, them since then. Still pretty good from the 30s until uh, <laughs> till the 80s. Yeah. It's pretty good. Um, so he was the one who really persuaded me to start thinking about getting involved in fanzine publishing. Mm -hmm. And and uh, did you guys do, do your first publication together? Was, were you co-editors? We were to be co-editors. He was to do the production work and I was to do the actual editing. But um, we were going to use the hectograph. And he got turned off of hectographs permanently after turning out three or four pages. <laughs> <laughs> the purple stain. <laughs> he decided he was going to retire from plans in publishing. So I had all this material on hand and had some money on hand. People actually sent money in those days when you announced a fanzine. Just just on the promise of a yeah, fanzine. Yeah, just on the promise of a fanzine. Had some money and all this material for it and I decided to take over. Uh -huh. We found a church mimeograph for ten dollars in Hagerstown. Oh, classic. And um, that was how it started. Well, what was the name of it? Space Boys. That was the first space. The first place. issue appeared late in 1938. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have my research says November 38 was the first November, issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so you essentially ended up doing it all yourself, despite Jim Avery's. Uh, Promises. Yes, I carried him as co-editor for a year or two, but he didn't actually do anything. <laughs> this sounds <laughs> That's a pretty good deal for him on the show. Um, now, what kind of material did you have in that first issue? It was a gen zine. Mm -hmm. completely. It would be very dull for fans today because it had some amateur science fiction in it and some articles about famous pro writers and some speculations on the future of this or that. Mm -hmm. Uh, world event and um, book reviews. I guess Lance Lantern would be its closest. Um, well, Lance will probably flatter to hear that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that general sort of material, but uh -huh. it was never nearly as big as Lance Lantern. Yeah. How, how did you get your material? Like I wrote know. letters. I wrote letters to about a dozen famous pros whose mm -hmm. address I could come up with. Most of them responded promptly and sent me material. It was amazing. It is amazing. I, I, I was aware that uh, later on in its history, Spaceways was known for having a lot of pro contributors, but I didn't realize it started with the very first issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's impressive. Did you, did you have any artwork in the first issue? My father drew a cover for me. That Your was father his. drew a cover for you? He drew a cover of a spaceship, a very nice spaceship. That's great. That was his one and only piece of fan act. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's, again, what a contrast to the typical expectation where you get you know, parents completely not understanding what fandom is about or interested in it. You no, know, I had the best parents anybody ever had, and they were very happy to have me mixed up in this. Uh -huh. 
Now, did your father, you, you mentioned before that your father brought home those Jules Verne books for you from the library. Was, did he read fantastic fiction himself? He had a moderate interest in science fiction. He loved sea stories above everything else. Mm. He was a great sea story man. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so you bought, your father did this illustration. Did, did he cut it on stencil for yeah, you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Now, what kind of mimeo was this? Do you remember? Was it an A.B. Dick? Very ancient A.B. Dick. Uh -huh. okay. Not even a gold, no soap sheeting arrangement, no automatic paper feed. You had the paper in my hand. And, uh -huh. But it was a rotary model. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, okay. It wasn't a flatbed. No, it wasn't. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Do you remember what your first print run was on Spaceways? I'm not sure. I think I ran to around 100 copies, I believe. Uh -huh. I couldn't swear to that. How, how many pages in the first issue? Uh, about 24. And so a choir stencil, that's pretty typical. Yeah. You, you kept that pattern for a long time with Horizons Most, later on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most issues of Spaceways were around 24 pages. Mm -hmm. I made a couple of vanishes larger. Mm -hmm. And and remember what it cost to mail a fanzine back then? Oh, I think three cents something like that. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I knew the answer, but it's still painful to hear it. I sold them three for a quarter, and I usually broke even, so I couldn't have spent too much on postage. Uh-huh. Um, so you've been, now this was already a few years into, uh, after you first saw some fanzines in response to that, uh, that letter of brass tax. It, do you feel that any of the zines you were seeing were, in any sense, models for what you were doing, or were you going off in your own direction of what I kind of sense of what a fan team should be? Oh, if anybody served as a model, I think it might have been Bob and Nadal with his science, Fantasize Digest, I think they called it. He um, had a general mix of material pretty much like mine. Uh -huh. And I probably modeled off him as much as anybody. Uh, and how did you generate your mailing list back then? I mean, right now I can call up Bob Lickman as I did for Corflu and say, send me a disc with all your names on it for Trapdoor, but what'd you do back then? Well, I got some addresses out of fanzines. We sent out announcements that Space Boys was to be published, and some people did actually send mm -hmm. money. money. Mm -hmm. And I arranged trades with most of the existing fanzines. Uh -huh. Now, were you already a, a fairly active letter of comment writer at this point in your fan career? Uh, I wrote letters to some of the fan scenes I got with comments, but um, at that time nobody ever thought of giving away a free issue for a letter of comment. That was something that had not been invented yet. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I was as uh, regular with... Yeah, the same letters. incentive wasn't there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is jumping ahead probably historically, but would you, can you tell us roughly when you think that, that custom of exchanging issues for locks came about? It happened sometime. While I was reasonably inactive in general fandom, and I've never been able to establish who started it. Hmm. I tried and tried to find out when I was writing my history of fandom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody could remember who invented it. Hmm, that's interesting. It's very ironic you haven't been able to find that out. You consider that probably no one's gotten more free issues than you have over the years. Uh, well, I asked this different people, and I believe I even published my problem in a couple of fan scenes, and nobody could come up with the answer. Hmm. I wasn't too active in general fandom from around the middle of 1940s to the middle of 1950s. I stayed active in FAPA, did some corresponding, but um, I sort of lost track of how things were going on in general fandom during those years. Was there any particular reason for that decline in your activity? I was awful busy at my job and um, had some problems at home, and it just practical to Sounds continue like on typical, the level I had started out. Typical pattern, yeah. We all tend to be most ambitious with the Kryphonak at the earliest stages. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did you, uh, this is probably, the answer to this is probably obvious. Oh, actually, I shouldn't jump ahead to that. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about Spaceways. Um, now, I, again, my research shows there were something like 30 issues. That's right. The last one being in September of 42. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the, how you feel the thing evolved over those 30 issues? Uh, I'm not sure it really evolved. It was pretty much the same at the end as it was at the beginning as far as contents were concerned. Mm -hmm. I ran a little bit more art work towards the end than I had at the start. Circulation was a little larger, but um, it didn't really change too much. Mm -hmm. well, why, did, why did you feel a need to do it? Oh, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to express myself. Mm -hmm. I always liked to write. I always thought I'd like to edit, and uh, this was the opportunity. 
Well, what was the reaction in, in fandom to, to Space Force? It was reasonably, reasonably popular. It finished number one in a few polls. It was considered one of the best scenes of the period and still deserves a place high on the all-time list, I would say. But I'm speaking mostly from, uh, on the basis of reputation from what I've read about it, because I don't think I have any issues in my collection, or maybe one late one. Mm. Uh, I was going to check that, but my collection's not in the greatest of shape these days either. Uh, was there any particular reason you, just, you stopped at 42 and suggested that maybe it was the paper shortages of the war, but... Uh... Uh, partly the wartime problem, partly because of serious illness in my family. Mm -hmm. And um, partly because I had just switched, or I was switching from railroad work to newspaper work. Mm -hmm. And I found I didn't want to work on the fanzine all day and then go down to the newspaper and right. work on the newspaper all night. I understand this problem exactly. Um, I think a lot of fans in publishing have that kind of reaction. I do want to talk a little bit more about your, your mundane career, but um, I, first I want to talk a little bit more about the the fanzine publishing side here. Um, now the first issue of Horizons was in October 39, I believe, mm -hmm. and that was for FAP from the beginning, I suppose. No, that was no. a Gen Zine 2. It was a Gen Zine 2? All fiction at first. Wow, all right. Tell me about that. So you decided you wanted to do a fiction zine that would conflict with your already established identity for Spaceways? Uh, the main reason Horizons got started was some woman out in the Midwest started to send me these long, long stories. And uh, they weren't real good, but they weren't real bad. Mm. I hated to reject them. And I didn't have room for them in spaceways. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll start a little hectograph fanzine with just fiction in it. And I publish her stories in the new fanzine. Mm. And uh, after probably four or five issues, I dropped the fiction theme and just switched it into FAPA and started to write it all myself. Now, was that at, was that at the point when you joined FAPA or had you been in FAPA before? I had been that? in FAPA for a few mailings before I switched horizons. Was Spaceways going through FAPA prior to that? No, Spaceways never went through FAPA. Okay, so what, what was your initial FAPA theme called? Uh, the FAPA correspondent. I put out a couple issues of that uh -huh. and also put a couple of leaflets, one single sheeters through FAPA. Uh -huh. But Horizons was my first major FAPA. Yeah. And I'm interested to hear this, really, because this is the point that I raised with Don Walheim also. The, the very quick shift from the original intentions for FAPA, uh, from the idea Walheim had, was going to be a way for people to distribute already existing fan themes, and active fans could be certain they would get everything, to the idea that it would be a regular amateur press association for which people produced specific zines. Um, and it, so it seems like right from the start you figured, well, you didn't want to send Spaceways through FAPA. You had your list of subscribers and regular people who were getting it, and uh, FAPA would have to get something else. That's very interesting. Well, I think most FAPA members were already on my mailing list for Spaceways, and I was getting income from some of them. <laughs> Trade. <laughs> so right. Well, give away what you can get. Spaceways and FAPA probably would have lost a lot of fanzines and mm -hmm. a lot of precious money, maybe a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> it was budgeted at about five dollars an issue for the first few issues. Uh -huh. I could put out nearly a hundred copies for about five dollars. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. All right. Uh, uh, continuing along the same line of questioning, uh, in his 1968 introduction to All Our Yesterdays, Bob Tucker cites uh, a zine you did for Ipso, which was an APA, uh, and then also the fanzine service for fans and service project that you were involved in in 42. And he sort of cites those as, as, in a sense, two of your fanzine titles, in addition to Horizons and, and Spaceways. He also hints that there was another title he didn't know. Do you know what he's referring to there? <laughs> uh, if somebody wants to hand me a copy of, uh, of All Yesterdays, I, I probably stuck it in my bag there. I'll quote the exact passage. I did the production work on several fanzines. He may have been thinking about those. Uh -huh. I put out Julie Younger's fantasy fiction people for quite a few issues. It was being published down here? No, he provided material. I did the stenciling and, and, but, and, and But who mailed it out? I did. You mailed it out for wait a minute, Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I believe I sent the bulk. You sent your bulk mailed it back to him and then okay, he had to remail it out again? Mailed him out. That's interesting. All right. I've produced several issues of the Southern Star, which was the first real fanzine out of the South. Mm -hmm. I worked on some uh, 
3F publications uh -huh. called the Fish Organ Bonfire in its early years. Well, I guess any of those could be possible answers to the thing he raises here, but I'll just read, you, read this passage here just for the hell of it. Uh, he says, The Hermit of, ha of uh, Hagerstown has also been responsible for three other publishing ventures, but I can describe only two of them. He published um, Harrison's, it says here, yeah. while he was a member of Ipso. Now, it, uh, how about action? Where does that title come from, Harrison's? Is that a play on your name? or? It was a play on Horizons, uh -huh. and also on Harrison, who was a legendary fan hero in England and Ireland at oh. the time. Oh, There's a whole cycle of fan fiction about Harrison and his mighty deeds. Oh, I never heard about Harrison. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'll have to ask some of the British fans about that. Uh, so that was for Ipso, an amateur journalism society, and in 1942, the pair of us, that is, Bob Tucker and Harry, mm -hmm. collaborated on a brief fling known as Fanzine Service for Fans and Service. Collectors need not bother hunting for that. I believe the two-paged flyer endured for only one issue, although the service may have later been incorporated into some other publication. The Hermit's only remaining fan title is a mystery to me. I am reasonably certain it existed somewhere, somewhen, because he once dropped a clue to that effect, but the mystery was never explained to me. Yeah, do you have anything what it's referring to there? He's talking mysterious. about the fact that correspondence, but that's yeah. conceivable. I can't think of any other titles I used, but okay. um, various fans have come up with episodes from my past which I had completely forgotten, so okay. I might have published something else. Just keep this at hand in case it comes to me. And of course, since I've joined SAPS, I publish Rip Fan Winkle for SAPS. Okay. I thought I was going to ask you, I'm glad you brought up SAPS. Uh, what other app has you, you've been in over the years I might not be aware of? I mean, uh, from Ip, I don't know about Ipso from reading that passage there, and uh, FAPA, of course, is obvious. I was in TAPS with you, so I know yeah, about TAPS. Yeah, I was TAPS. in TAPS for several years. And TAPS scenes don't have titles, usually, so that, that doesn't write. They're written as letters, tell me. Oh. Uh, you write Dear TAPS, that's the form. Uh, modeled on the cult, I guess. Um, and uh, any other app that you've been in? That, uh, I believe that's about the size of it. I've been on the waiting list for one app for 30 years. Really? Mm -hmm. It has four members, and all four members remain active, and I can't get in until one of them drops out. So the, one of those private app is? Carbon copy. Carbon copy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Who are the four members? Anybody we've heard of? Or? Bob Solberg's one. Oh. Oh. Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing you're going to say? Well, he may have to respect their privacy. They, they really won't allow him to expand by one more person. President after Bush is waited the all these years. God. That's mean. Yeah, talk about <laughs> exclusive. That outdoes anything I've ever heard of. Uh, ne never been a member of CEFPA? No. No? Okay. Southern, Southern Connection didn't appeal particularly? or. Oh, so SFPA? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not used to hearing. You see, that's. From being a hermit, you don't hear the Spanish terms no. pronounced. You guys do pronounce it, don't you, Hank? Sepa. Sepa, yeah. Yeah, I've joined just up BA just in the past few weeks. Set off my first uh, zine to them just early in March. Uh -huh. yeah, what's your zine title there? The Jewel of the Senile. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think he's unrecognized for as a humorist. You know, I was rereading re -reading passages in all our yesterdays mm. in the last week, and there's a lot of subtle stuff in here that I didn't get when I was younger, but I get now. Yeah, I, I thought it was like a very well, certain... A lot of low-key, but great, great humor in here. I don't know whether now this video is going to America's Funniest Videos or America's, <laughs> <laughs> or America's Most Wanted. I'm not sure. You know? uh, okay, so, so, so we've got FAPS, uh, FAPA, SEFPA, TAPS. <laughs> Uh, if so, Tips. taps. Is that everything? Okay. As far as I can say, remember. Who, who, who else was in Ipso aside from you and Tucker? Ipso? Yeah, who was in Ipso? Uh, it was mostly British. It was a special app of where discussion was supposed to be limited to one topic each distribution. Hmm. The man in charge would set a topic and you were supposed to concentrate on that. And of course it broke down because everybody wanted to comment on previous topics uh -huh. and uh, it soon collapsed yeah. from the ability to hold to its original premise. Yeah, that idea has been invented more than once. There was an American app with the same concept and I remember someone telling me about it when I came up with the same idea mm -hmm. sometime in the 70s and was told it had already been done. Mm -hmm. and so that's interesting. 
too bad it doesn't. I think it is an interesting idea. Too bad it doesn't work better. Well, I think what you should what you should do is you take one section which is talking about the question, and then you take a comment section, and you have your essay, and you have a bunch of, of freelance sort of comments, and that's the way you can organize it. Shall we? <laughs> I think it would be a good idea to try to revive on that basis. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to do something like that. Actually, talking about books, mm -hmm. maybe just pick one one yeah. book or, or one author for, uh, uh, for for an issue, and then do comments. Is that kind of stuff being done on some of the some of the networks, computer networks now? I think. Is it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think. So. Now, anyway, uh, just to finish up the wrap up the APA topic, uh, do you think you could uh, do some sort of compare and contrast type stuff uh, how, how you, about the different APAs you've been in? Well, at least uh, let's say the APAs you're in now. Just keep it relatively simple. Um, I think they're still sending you taps, even though you're not active, probably. No, I haven't seen taps for years and years. I thought they voted you a permanent uh, place on the mailing list. Or yes, they did. Like and it took me two years to get myself on permanent. Oh, they went down. Okay. <laughs> I had a terrible time getting off that mailing list, but I just <laughs> keep on uh, contributing. It was too much of a strain. Okay. So, so you're currently just in SAPS, Seth Button, and FAPA. Yeah. How about, how about, how would you compare? Maybe too soon in some cases, because you... Uh, haven't been in them that long yet, but do you think you could make some comments about how they seem different or the same to you? Well, SAPS I enjoy very much. It's probably the friendliest mm -hmm. of all APAs. It also probably well, has the highest average age of any APA. And about half of it is concentrated in the Seattle area, so it may be the most top-heavy APA in that respect. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy membership in SAPS very much. It has so many people in it. That are out of general fandom, GM Carr and the Busbys, Burnett Tosky, and people like that who were famous in the 50s and 60s but restrict themselves now to saps. Uh, Ray Ballard, mm -hmm. a lot of fabulous names. Wally Weber is getting back in. Hmm. That, I think, is badly on the decline. I've been toying with the idea of dropping out. I don't know whether I'll have the nerve to do it or not. I, I would think with the momentum of, of 200 issues of Horizons behind it, it's hard to break that string. Well, I can shift Horizons to another app and uh -huh. keep it going. Uh -huh. SFBA I haven't seen very much of yet. I've seen only three mailings, but it impresses me for the energy and um, for the fact that there are a lot of people in there I hadn't known before, like you. Yeah. I'm talking to Tony now. Yeah. And, um, I think I'm going to enjoy myself very much if I manage the strain of producing every two months. Yeah. Thank goodness I found a six cent per copy source of duplicating in Hagerstown, so. Yeah, but I was going to ask you about what you're currently doing because I know that um, you used to get your, you used to get Horizons reproduced by the Coulsons, I think. Yeah, the Lynchers are doing it now. Uh -huh. And um, it's fine for a three month APA to have your memory graphing done elsewhere, but when the app appears every other month, it just isn't time to farm out the reproduction yeah, to somebody how else. How far are Dick and Nicky from here? How, how far away are Dick and Nicky from here? About 70 miles, oh. 65, 70. Uh, Do they come and visit? Yeah, yeah, they've been here several times. They usually bring Cheryl Burkhead along with them. Mm -hmm. We I'd went love to see Cheryl. the Hagerstown Suns last year. And, um, oh, neat. I think you're interested in baseball. I would, if we would gotten you to come to New York, you could have gone to Yankee Stadium and Shea Stadium. All right, anyway. <laughs> I've never been to Shea Stadium. I've been to Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you about the app. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that people in, you think the people in SAPS average older in age than the people in FAPA, despite FAPA's reputation for being the old time in the FAPA. Um, but I guess FAPA also tends to attract people by its reputation, and you get some younger guys like me, and even younger than me, coming in. All right, before we, before we leave this whole topic of fanzines in general, I also wanted to ask you about a fanzine you didn't do. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Odd Tales hoax? Well, I wrote about that in all our yesterdays, and I'm sure I can't remember about it as much as I put in there, but it was something that was rather elaborate. We, for instance, got A. Merritt to give his permission to use his name on the cover. I, probably still had a telegram from him somewhere up on the attic. Mm -hmm. It, uh, I can't remember anymore where we got the cover illustration, but it was very... It's Hans Bach, I think, isn't it? Uh, or sure. something like. It looks like Hans Bach. Yeah. But it was a very, um, 
and process it and cover, which mm -hmm. was photographed. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it was photographed and sent out to Julie Unger's fantasy fiction field. It says, Here's you stay in here, Harry, an original painting by Hannes Bach. I do. Uh, That's what you say. <laughs> Uh, well, how, you know, how common were hoaxes at that point? They were very big at that time. There were hoaxes of all types. John Spear, Jack Spear had John Bristol as a hoax fan. Mm -hmm. And um, there were hoax issues of fanzines and death hoaxes and all sorts of hoaxes. I, I remember being sort of pleasantly surprised when I came across that passage in the war yesterday because I think by the time I came in the fandom, you already had this kind of image of being this old, very respectable, you know, elder god of fandom. And the idea of doing something as sort of frivolous and, and pure fun as a hoax mm -hmm. just shattered that completely. You know? This was a hoax prosine? It was, it, was yeah. it was a hoax prosine, and, and it was very convincingly done. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you and had the cover made up and distributed uh, copies it was of the proposed copy? and the photograph was distributed, pasted on the copy. Did you start getting slush pile uh, <laughs> submissions? Submissions, yeah. I don't believe that we went that far. I can't even remember the other participants in the idea. Who was the editor? I can't remember who was supposed to be the editor, and I don't remember exactly what my function was other than helping with the dissemination of news about it. Mm. I'm trying to see if you give any the details on it in the book here. Yeah. Incidentally, when I read about your book, it cleared up. You can move that bag too. Okay, repeat your question. Uh, uh, should I be looking over at him or at the Yeah. Camera? Yeah, pretend he's here. Oh, anyway, my first world. You can clear something up for Try me. Again. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, anyway, uh, when I read all our yesterdays, it cleared something up for me because when I got to Tricon in 66, my first Worldcon, Howard DeVore has put an ad in the program, and one of the things that he showed was the cover of Odd Tales saying, if, uh, saying, sorry, we don't have any Odd Tales this time, but we have some of the following. Uh, and I, I was wondering for years what the hell Odd Tales was. <laughs> then something like six uh, years later, I, I got a copy of all our yesterdays and, uh, and I was completely enlightened. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it turns out that Harry's hoax worked down through the years yeah. and had repercussions. All the way to 1966. Wow, that's <laughs> impressive. Okay. Confused a, um, a, a neo fan in his 20s. <laughs> you want me to say the same again? Uh, anyway, when I first, uh, I think she wants you to look at me. Uh, no, it doesn't <laughs> matter. Uh, anyway, when, it, uh, when I finally got to read All Our Yesterdays, uh, it cleared up something about Odd Tales for me, because when I got to my first Worldcon, which is the Tricon in Cleveland 66, uh, in the program booklet there was an ad from Howard DeVore, Big Hearted Howard, uh, which showed Odd Tales, the famous cover, and said, Sorry, we don't have any copies of Odd Tales, but we've got some of the following, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I was wondering for years what Odd Tales was, until I finally read your book, and uh, all was solved, you know. It's like uh, getting a message from the Rosicrucians, uh, Mysteries of the Universe. <laughs> 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 well, see, if you've actually seen the cover of Odd Tales, it gives the thing away. I, it, Harry expressed a surprise in the book that people were fooled because the initials of the story titles on the cover Spelled fake, lie, hoax, and false, and read them down the other way. <laughs> so, people were not exactly tremendously perceptive, if, I guess. So. Well, that was supposed to be the difference between a hoax and a, just plain a lie. <laughs> and a hoax should be a clue ah. somewhere along the line that people will understand it's really a hoax and will feel very happy to have been so perceptive. Mm. I never thought of it that way before, but I like that distinction. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. I wish people now they would remember that. Years later, I was involved in a convention box, which has never been formally publicized. Oh, what was that? There was a convention announced for far western Maryland, the WISPCON, W-I-S-P-C-O-N. Mm -hmm. It was to be held at a skiing resort known as the WISP. This was, um, I believe Doug Kratz was the prime mover in that, and I helped him out. He sent letters to all the Pittsburgh fans, warning them not to come because it wasn't going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we figured that they would be the only fans close enough to make a trip in the dead of winter to a con at the ski resort. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apparently nobody ever tumbled to the fact that the con never existed. 
<laughs> hmm. got listings here and there. And we never heard any complaints from anybody who showed up. So. <laughs> well, they all skied and had a good time. Good thing, yeah. It was, it was all a will of the wisp. Huh? Yeah, it's a very inaccessible a place out in far western Maryland. But nobody would be crazy enough to try to drive to in the middle of January or whatever it was that was supposed to be scheduled. Hmm. Hmm. The depths of your of your uh, deceptive cleverness are amazingly new here. I have no idea. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. What was that? Where? I can't remember now where I was going to go next after the odd tales question. Um, all right. Well, I guess the logical thing to follow up the discussion of your of your fan publishing is uh, talk a little bit about how you made the transition from being a fan publisher to being fandom's most famous letter of comment writer, letter hack. Well, all of a sudden, fanzines started to come in back in the mid-1950s, and um, I soon realized that they expected letters of comment. I was younger then, I could adapt to new conditions better than I can now, mm -hmm. and I um, started to write letters of comment to them, and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. Have you kept carbon for all these letters? Most of them. Huh. Usually the carbons are so faint they can't be read anyway, but... And all your letters were typed on that Underwood? Well, all with a few, very few exceptions. Maybe two or three times a year on a slow night at the office, I would type a letter at the office. I wrote a few letters by longhand when I was in the hospital with broken bones. But um, probably 99, 9 tenths percent of all my fan act has been done on that typewriter since the middle 1940s. Wow. When the fans see this, they'll want to send you a computer. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I've had that reaction already in this conversation. When he was talking about trying to keep up with the, his level of app I'm in act that he'll have now. Uh, my immediate re reaction was to tell him he should, we should, you know, he should get a word processor. And I remember the stories he was telling about how much he hated the machines at work. And I think one of the reasons he thought about early retirement was that he didn't like those machines. That was one reason I didn't like to keep on working. I learned to use them, but I never was able to get happy with them after three years of practice. Hmm. So um, I don't think I would want a word processor or a computer or anything of the sort. No, you didn't have the right teacher. See, I, I kinda, I, I, my reaction is the same. I can't help but wonder if, if maybe now with superior software made for the average person rather than the professional stuff he was using at the office, that wouldn't he might find it more comfortable to use. I also think about Isaac Asimov. You know, Isaac rejected the idea of using a computer or a word processor for a long time and finally he was given one as part of a promotional deal with Tandy Radio Shack and wanted him to endorse the product and he was very very hesitant but they brought it in and they taught him how to use it and he would, would never go back to the typewriter after that. And I'm not so sure it's had the best effect on his writing in some ways. <laughs> uh, he's now writing faster than ever but the fact is he's very comfortable with it so uh, something to think about. I don't know maybe we should bring a machine over here for him to try out sometime and see if he, you know, without, without attempting to make the investment in it, see if he can get used to it. Next time I find a spare computer, I'll... Well, I do have an electric typewriter, which I've been telling myself I'm going to start using for the last two years, and mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. done so yet. The main problem is adjusting to the feathered yeah. touch of the electric machine. I'm used to... Yeah, pounding. really pounding on the underwood. Well, in fact, the touch on the word processor is even lighter, and that's part of what I like about it, is I can type a lot faster. Uh, with reasonable accuracy on work. Yeah, and as you get older, the lighter, the better. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, now, I was going to ask you, speaking about pounding away in the underwood, is the, is the reason the carbons are light because your carbon paper is weak or because it's hard to hit hard enough? Mm, because I don't change the carbon paper often. Okay. <laughs> I find I never refer to the carbon copies anyway. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm gonna, maybe I'll send you a box of carbon for Christmas. <laughs> no, it's been 25 years since I really needed to go back and see if somebody had betrayed me and <laughs> he had and I cut him off my long well, list. <laughs> if, you, if you've kept all these carbons, do you have any do you have any notion of how many letters of comment you've written over the no, years? I have no idea. I file the carbon with the fans in. Uh -huh. So they aren't all together in one place. Ah, uh, okay. I tried to calculate once on the basis of probably writing two hundred and fifty blocks a year on the average. Wow. So that would be twenty five hundred and ten years and about 10,040 years. Wow. And That's letter writing of Lovecraftian proportions. Yeah. Really is that that many fanzines also, or are there even more fanzines? More fanzines. I don't respond to all the fanzines, no matter what my reputation is. Harry, do you have 
some good bracing up here in the ceiling to keep the <laughs> attic from collapsing on us, or if you move the stuff down in the basement. So there, there are 10,000 fans. There's a crack fanzines. over there, right over Tony's head. Yeah. Thank you. Wait, you mean there are 10,000 fanzines about to drop on my head? <laughs> More than 10,000. Some of them are in the cellar, some of them are in the attic, some of them are upstairs, and some of them are sitting around on chairs down here waiting to be. Now, are they, how are they organized up there? Are they just chronological? Are, um, they keeping, are you keeping them alphabetical? No, just. Helder Piled randomly? Helder uh, Are yeah. they kept in boxes? Boxes, bags, out in the open, just wherever the fate. It, it really sounds like, like the fantasy I had my first few years in fandom should have been acted upon. I, I told you this once, that I had this idea that I was going to come down to Hagerstown for the summer, get a cheap room somewhere, and spend my time working in your attic, uh, organizing your collection. I think Linda's got